Silly Millie. For someone who doesn't want to die, you sure spent a lot of time talking about it. The voice surrounding her said. But that's the way of things, isn't it? Talk is always easier than action. I think, Millie said, sniffling, that when I said I wanted to die, what I really wanted was to escape. I didn't want death. I just wanted my life to be different. Oh, but that really takes action, doesn't it? The voice said. Changing a life for the better, especially when the world is such a mean, rotten place. It's much easier, and ultimately much more satisfying, just to sniff it out. Oh, snuff it out, sorry. Uh, which brings me to my second set of options, much more interesting ones. These are quick and easy for you, for the most part, but they require a little more effort from me. I'm not complaining, though. There's nothing I like more than a good challenge to relieve my boredom. Say, you like Dracula, don't you? Millie could barely find her voice to answer. Why? Are you going to bite my neck? Now how would I do that? With you in my belly, silly girl. I know that you're a Dracula fan. The kids at school call you Dracula's daughter, don't they? Well... What you might not know is that the character of Dracula was inspired by a real person, a prince named Vlad Dracula, but he's better known by his nickname, Vlad the Impaler. <laughs> I can't even do this voice anymore. Vlad the Impaler. Millie's insides seemed to turn to jelly. Vlad killed thousands of his enemies. But his crowning achievement was creating a forest of the impaled, where thousands of his victims, men, women and children, were skewered through stakes driven into the ground. Now I'm no prince, and I can't aspire to that level of achievement. But one little odd impaling can't be that hard, can it? I can just take one of my metal rods and drive it through my body cavity, and it will go straight through you and out the other side. If the spike goes through your vital organs, death comes quickly. If it doesn't, there can be some hours of bleeding and suffering. The people who walked through the forest of the impaled talked about the moaning and gasping of their victims. So, impaling, one might say other deaths impale in comparison. The voice's tone was cheery. It can work quickly or slowly, but the result is the same in the end. Like I said... Win, win. No, Millie whispered. She wanted her mum and dad. She wanted her grandpa. They would help her if they only knew. She'd even settle for goofy Uncle Rob and Aunt Sherry as long as they would come to her rescue. She would even put on a Christmas sweater if it made them happy. Ooh. Millie sat at her table in the cafeteria expectantly. She had taken special care with her appearance this morning choosing a lacy black top and a jet Victorian morning necklace from her small collection. Her face powder enhanced her pallor, and her black eyeliner had the perfect cat-like effect. As minutes passed, she started to worry. What if Dylan didn't show up? What if he... What if she had gotten all dressed up for nothing? What if, as she'd always expected, life no, offered no possibility of pleasure or happiness? But then there he was with his leather jacket and fire engine red hair and shiny silver earrings. Hey, Millie said, trying not to sound like she was too happy to see him. Hey, he said, setting his tray on the table and sitting across from her. I brought you something. Millie's heart pounded in excitement. She hoped she didn't show it. He reached into, his, into the pocket of his leather jacket and pulled out a worn paperback look. H.P. Lovecraft, he said. I was telling you about him yesterday. I remember, Millie said, taking the book. The Call of Cthulhu and other stories. Did I say that right, C Cthulhu? Who knows, Dylan said. H.P. Lovecraft made it up and he's dead, so we can't ask him. You can keep the book. I got a copy and hardcover for my birthday, he grinned. My parents are cool. They don't mind that I like weird stuff. Thanks. She felt a little smile creeping up on her. She slipped the book into her bag. She would certainly read the book, but it wasn't the book itself that was making her feel all smiley. It was that Dylan had thought of her. While he was at home, not in her presence, he had thought of her, found the book, put it in his jacket pocket, and remembered to give it to her. In her experience, boys weren't usually this thoughtful. 
After dinner, in her room, Millie started reading the H.P. Lovecraft book. Dylan was right. It was weird. Weirder than Poe stuff, even, and scary in a way that made it feel like spiders were crawling beneath her skin. But she loved it. It was the perfect gift for Dylan to give her. Millie wasn't a flowers and candy kind of girl. After she read a couple of stories, she opened her laptop. Instead of googling poems about death, she searched for poems about love. She found the famous one by Elizabeth Barrett Browning that began, How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. She had read the poem before and thought of it just as pretty words, but now she could appreciate the feelings behind the words. Strong feelings for the rare person who truly understood you and whom you understood in return. She took out her black leather journal, um, chewed on her pen, and thought, uh, uh, sorry, and thought. Finally, she wrote, You clipped away the black thorny vines that twisted around my wounded heart so it could beat and feel relief from pain. You are the gardener who wakes the plants from the grey, chilly death of winter so that they can blossom again like my heart, a slow-blooming, blood-red rose. She read the poem back to herself and sighed with satisfaction. Her mood only darkened slightly when she set her journal aside to start on her homework. Oh my god, another one of these sections. <laughs> no, pity. I always think impaling has a certain dramatic flair. Perhaps something with a little more zing. Electrocution is always an effective option. Did you know that the idea of the electric chair was developed in the 1800s by a dentist named Alfred, uh, uh, Alfred P. Southwick? He came up with the idea of electric chairs based on his dental chair. That's not exactly conf uh, comforting to people with dental phobias, now is it? I don't have a chair to strap you into, but I do have the power to shoot a series of strong electrical currents through my body cavity. If the current zaps your heart or brain, you'll die quickly. If it doesn't, you'll have some nasty burns, and your heart will go into fibrillation, which will genuinely, generally kill you if it doesn't, uh, if you don't have help. I'm stumbling now. Um, it's the voice. And I think we've already established that you don't have anyone here to help you. Help was a word Millie wanted desperately to scream, but she knew it was a waste of energy. Energy she needed to conserve if she had any hope of survival. <clears throat> so, what do you think, Cupcake? Electrocution? You'd be shocked at how effective it is. An electrifyingly good time. Another chuckle. Millie had once experienced a shock unplugging her hairdryer from a wall socket in a badly wired hotel room. She had felt the electricity tear, or tear painfully up her arm, and for a few moments was as out of breath as if someone had punched her in the stomach. She didn't want to think about how an electric current shock strong enough to kill her would feel. A good time for you, but not for me, she said. On Saturday afternoon, when most other kids were at the mall or the movies or hanging out at, another one's, uh, at one another's houses, Millie walked downtown to the public library. It was about a 20 minute walk, so the walk there and back with an hour or two of browsing and reading sandwiched in between was a pleasant way to spend a Saturday afternoon in solitude. Today she roamed the library stacks looking for suitably dark reading material. She had finished The Call of Cthulhu and was disappointed that there weren't any more books by Lovecraft on the shelves. Hey, a voice called behind her. She gasped and jumped, but then saw it was Dylan. I didn't mean to startle you, he said. Hey, did you read that Lovecraft book? Millie couldn't believe that the stars had aligned such that she had run into Dylan outside of school. Yeah, I, I loved it. I was kind of hoping they'd have more stuff by him here. Hmm, Dylan said. But I can pick something else you'd like. Give me a sec. With a thoughtful expression, he scanned the shelves, then pulled out a thin book with a black cover and handed it to her. The Lottery and Other Stories by Shirley Jackson, she read. Um, <laughs> fun fact, I have read this, this story, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, and it is, uh, I would suggest it, it is its own Fazbear Frights book, except it's got nothing to do with Freddy, of course. Um, it's so good, the ending is amazing, and I'm pretty sure he says it here. Yep, you'll love her. It's the perfect book to continue your classic horror pursuits. Hey, he said, I was reading at that table over there until I saw you. If you want to sit there and read too, you can. Okay, 
Millie worked hard not to show how happy this invitation made her. I've got to admit, I've got an ulterior motive inviting you, Dylan said. I want to see the look on your face once you finished reading the first short story in that book. They sat at the table across from each other and read in compassionable silence. Millie loved talking with Dylan, but being quiet with him was nice too. She read the lottery with a growing feeling of suspense. And when she got to the ending, Dylan laughed. You're reading with your mouth hanging open, he said. It's the ultimate surprise ending, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> I told you that the, the ending is great. It's so, it's a really well put together story. Um, Say, so, Dylan said, I was thinking that after I check out my books, I might have a cup of tea at the cafe next door. Would you like to do that too? I mean, you don't have to drink tea just because I do. You can have coffee or hot chocolate. Tea sounds nice, Millie said. This afternoon was turning out to be nice, surprisingly so. Millie had passed you and me coffee and tea hundreds of times, but had never gone inside. It was a pleasant place with exposed brick walls displaying paintings by local artists. Sitting with Dylan over their steaming cups, Millie said, I think I might like to be a librarian someday. She had never told anyone this before. She'd always been afraid of getting laughed at. That'd be cool, Dylan said. You love books. I love books. And I love quiet, Millie said, sipping her Earl Grey, uh, Earl Grey tea. You should totally dress in a goth librarian style too, Dylan said. You could put your hair up and wear your jet jewellery and a black Victorian dress and those old-fashioned glasses that just clip onto your nose. What are they called? Pince-nez? <laughs> um, Dylan's grinned. Uh, yeah, those. And when you dress like that and shush people in the library, it'll scare the living daylights out of them. Minnie laughed, and she had to admit, it felt good. Aww. <laughs> uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, school days were better when she knew she'd have lunch with Dylan. She could spend the morning looking forward to seeing him and the afternoon thinking about what they'd said to each other. Sometimes she felt a little silly for spending so much time thinking about a boy. But Dylan wasn't just an ordinary boy. Today, when she got home from school, her grandpa met her in the cluttered living room. I thought we might go to the school holiday bazaar tonight, he said. Instead of his usual cardigan, he was wearing an ugly green pullover sweater decorated with creepy smiling Christmas trees. The holiday bazaar is stupid, Millie rolled her eyes. Just a bunch of people selling ugly Christmas tree ornaments at, made out of popsicle sticks. Oh, I always thought the bazaar was kind of fun when I was a teacher. This year there's a chili supper and you can choose between meat and vegetarian chili. And there's an all-you-can-eat cookie buffet. Think about those words for a minute, Millie. He paused dramatically. All-you-can-eat cookie buffet. You've really done your homework on this, haven't you? Millie said. She would never say it out loud, but it was kind of cute how excited Grandpa was. I have. I take cookies very seriously. I can see that, Millie sighed. Maybe just this time she could let the old man have something he wanted. The two of them didn't get out much, and it might be good for him to be among other people. Okay, I guess I'll go, even if it's not my thing. Great, Grandpa said. We'll leave in an hour. He looked up and down. Maybe you could wear something besides black. Something, you know, a little more festive. Don't push it, Grandpa, Millie said. She couldn't believe she'd agreed to attend such a lame event. But maybe Dylan would be there, under duress, like her. Uh, and they could make fun of it together. The school halls were sparkly with Christmas lights, and Millie had been correct in predicting the ugliness of the ornaments for sale, but the vegetarian chilli was tasty, and there was an impressive variety of cookies on the cookie buffet, including gingerbread, which was her favourite. After she and Grandpa ate their fill, she wandered the hallways, giving the impression of looking at the craft displays, but really looking for Dylan. She found him in the second floor hallway, but not in the way she wanted to. Dylan was standing in front of a booth uh, selling reindeer Christmas ornaments made out of candy canes, but he wasn't alone. He was with Brooke Harrison, a blandly pretty blonde girl who was in Millie's US government class. Dylan and Brooke were holding hands and laughing about some private joke in a very couplish way. Millie bit her lip to keep from gasping, turned around and ran through the hall and down the stairs. She had to find Grandpa. She had to get out of there. Where's the fire, Dracula's daughter? Some random kid said to her. She didn't even bother to process who it was. They were, they were all the same anyway. 
She ran into the cafeteria scanning the crowd for Grandpa's ugly Christmas sweater. Unfortunately, a lot of people were wearing ugly Christmas sweaters. She finally found Grandpa next to the drinks table sipping coffee and chatting with a couple of other old men who were also retired teachers. Oh, I love Grandpa. Oops. These guys apparently shopped at the same ugly Christmas sweater store as Grandpa. We have to go, Millie hissed at him. Grandpa knitted his brow in concern. Are you sick or something? No, I just have to go. Why wouldn't he move faster? Okay, honey. He gave the other guys a look that seemed to say, they're so emotional at this age, and then said, see you later, fellas. Merry Christmas. In the car, Grandpa said, what's the matter, honey? Did somebody at school say something that hurt your feelings? Millie couldn't believe that Grandpa could be so stupid. Nobody at school said anything to me because nobody at school ever says anything to me. Nobody at school cares whether I live or die. She stifled a sob and wiped under her eyes to try to stop the flow of tears. I can remember feeling that way when I was your age. I wouldn't go back to being 14 for anything, not even with all the years I'd get back. The tears weren't stopping. Millie looked out the window and tried to ignore Grandpa. He couldn't possibly understand. Nobody could understand, especially people who get excited about Christmas sweaters and cookies and all that fake happy stuff that filled their minds with to ward off the, their fear of death. Millie wasn't afraid of death. Right now, death felt like her only friend. My, my, we certainly are picky, aren't we? The voice said. For somebody who wants the end result, we're awfully fussy about how to achieve it. But there are lots more options. I feel like a waiter talking my way through a menu at the fancy restaurant. The difference, of course, is that one menu gets you fed, the other menu gets you dead. Low rumbling laughter. Oh, I crack myself up. Hmm, since I was talking about food, how about boiling? Did you know that Henry VIII made boiling alive the official form of punishment during his reign? Funny they, uh, funny that they call it boil, boiling alive, because goodness knows you don't stay alive for very long. But I could easily flood my insides with water, and then use my energy stores to bring the temperature up, up, up. First, it would look like at first it would feel like a nice warm bath, but then it would just keep getting hotter and hotter and hotter. I wonder if you turn red like a lobster. Well, that voice is really hard to do now. I'm losing it. <laughs> um, Millie sat miserably at her table in the cafeteria, knowing she was doomed to eat alone. She opened an anthology of horror stories she had checked out from the school library. Books, at least, would keep her company. But then Dylan sat across from her, acting like absolutely nothing was wrong. Hey, he said. How can you just sit across me like that? Millie said. He was so casual, opening up his ketchup packets and creating a little red puddle on his plate, just like always. Like what? Dylan said, looking lost. I sit here every day. I would think you'd want to sit with Brooke, Millie said. Brooke has a different lunch period than me. He obviously dipped a nugget into his ketchup puddle and d popped it into his mouth. Millie felt anger rising up all the way from her toes. So I'm what, your backup? Her understudy? Dylan rubbed his face like he was tired. I'm sorry Millie, I'm trying to keep up. I really am, but you're not making any sense. Millie couldn't understand how he could be so stupid. Dylan, I saw you with her at the bazaar last night. Yeah, so? She had never felt so exasperated. You were holding hands. You are clearly together. Yeah, so? He repeated. But then a look of realisation dawned on his face. Wait, Millie, did you think you and I were... dating? Millie swallowed hard and told herself not to cry. You noticed me. Brought me a book. Took me out for tea. Of course I thought we might. In the future, date, I mean. Wow, Dylan said. I'm sorry if I misled you. I mean... You're really great and really pretty and everything, but I never meant to make you think we were anything other than friends. Haven't you ever had a friend who's a boy, but who's not, you know, a boyfriend? Hannah had been Millie's only friend, but had abandoned her. There was no way Millie was sharing this fact with Dylan. Of course I have. But Dylan, you told me I was the only cool person you'd met at this school. I did, but that was my first day. I've met other cool people since then. Like Brooke? Millie's voice dripped with sarcasm. What, you don't approve of Brooke? 
Dylan said. She's blonde and basic, Millie said. No need to mince words, the truth is the truth. Have you ever had a conversation with her? Dylan asked. Do we even know what she's like? Had Millie ever heard Brooke say anything? She was quiet in the US government class, Millie assumed, because she had nothing interesting or important to say. I've never talked to her, Millie said. I don't talk to just anyone. Dylan shook his head. Well, Brooke isn't just anyone. She's smart and well-read and nice. She wants to be a veterinarian. Damn it, I said that wrong. <laughs> she wants to be a veterinarian. I'm just going to say a vet. She wants to be a vet. Why does it matter what colour her hair is? Dylan looked at her so hard, it was like he was looking through her. Millie, I'm disappointed in you. You of all people, with your black wardrobe and black eyeliner and black nail polish, it seems like you know better than to judge a person based on her appearance. You don't like when people do it to you, and yet you're guilty of the very same crime. I'm pretty sure that's called hypocrisy. He stood up. I think this conversation is over. He's right. <laughs> he, he's, he's very right there. He, he do got her. As the winter holidays approached, Millie's mood became grimmer and grimmer. The cold temperatures and the grey skies and the stripped bare trees all matched her emotional state perfectly. Cheerful holiday lights and plastic Santas on people's houses filled her with anger, and the sound of Christmas carols in stores and other public places enraged her. She felt that she couldn't be held responsible for her actions if she had to hear Winter Wonderland one more time. Holiday cheer, peace on earth, and goodwill were just lies people told themselves. Winter was the season of death. At dinner, vegetable stir fry. Uh, eh. At dinner, vegetable stir fry for Millie, chicken and vegetable stir fry for Grandpa. Grandpa said, Are you, "So you excited that tomorrow is the last day before winter break?" "Not really," Millie said. "Listen, I've been meaning to tell you, I'm not celebrating Christmas this year." Grandpa's face fell. "Not celebrating Christmas." But why ever not? Millie poked at a piece of broccoli with her fork. I refuse to pretend to be happy on some particular day just because society tells me I'm supposed to be. It's not about society. It's about family, Grandpa said. It's about getting together and enjoying each other's company. On Christmas Eve, your aunt and uncle and cousins are coming over and your mum and dad are going to Skype in so they can be a part of things. We'll have a big dinner and exchange gifts and then we'll have a hot chocolate and cookies and play board games. Millie felt nauseous at the thought of all of that false cheer. I'll be here because I don't have any place else to go, but I refuse to participate in the festivities. Is that a fact? Grandpa said. He pushed his plate away. Listen, Millie, you've never been a particularly cheerful child. Heaven knows you were the fussiest baby I've ever seen. And when you were a toddler, your temper tantrums were legendary. But I feel like you're especially unhappy here with me now. And I'm genuinely sorry for that. I'm an old man and I'm no expert in what young girls like, but I've tried to make things as nice for you as I can. Maybe it would have been better if you had chose to move at a, chosen to move abroad with your mum and dad. I know it must be hard to be so far away from them. I don't miss my parents, Millie shouted. But even as she said it, she wasn't sure it was true. Sure, they made her crazy sometimes when they were together, but it was weird having them so far away. And Skyping with them on Sunday nights wasn't nearly enough to make up for their absence from her everyday life. It didn't help that she tended to be in a bad mood during their Skype sessions, mad at them for being gone. And so the conversations weren't always pleasant. Okay, maybe you don't. Grandpa said. But something's been eating you lately. Maybe a problem at school <laughs> or a falling out with a friend. I'm not saying I could help, but sometimes it helps just to have someone to listen. Against her will, a picture of Dylan popped into her head. Dylan on the first day she met him when she couldn't believe this cool new guy who could have sat anywhere he wanted to in her cafeteria chose to sit right across from her. Well, that never happened anymore. Now he sat at a table with those guys who never talked about anything but fantasy role-playing games and Millie sat alone with only a book for company. I told you, I don't have any friends, Millie said. Well, maybe you should try to make one, Grandpa said. You don't have to be a social butterfly if you don't want to, but everybody needs one good friend. You don't know what I need, Millie stood up from the table. 
I'm going to do my homework. She didn't really have homework since tomorrow was the last day before break, but she'd say whatever she had to say to get out of there. And I'm going to my workshop, Grandpa said. You're not the only one who can storm out of a room, you know, girly. It was the first time since she had moved in with Grandpa that he sounded like he was actually mad at her. In her room, Millie opened her laptop, went to YouTube, and typed in Ozone audiobooks. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, and typed in Kurt Carrion music videos. She clicked on Death Mask, her favourite song. The video was filled with images of raisin ravens and bats encircling vultures. In the centre of it all was Kurt Carrion himself, growling his way through the morbid lyrics, his black hair spiky, his complexion pallid, his black eyeliner perfectly applied. Millie felt like Kurt Carrion might be the only person on the planet who might understand her. Who was she kidding? Nobody would. Please don't boil me alive, Millie said. She had to figure out a way to escape. Suddenly, desperately, she wanted to live. Not boiling? Well, understandable. By all accounts, it is a nasty way to go. People who observed boilings during Henry VIII's time said it was so sickening they would have preferred to see a beheading. Oh, there's a good one we haven't talked about yet. Decapitation. He said it like it was such a happy word. There are many ways to chop off a head, of course, and if the blade is sharp enough, it's fairly quick and painless. That being said, if the blade isn't sharp enough, well, poor Mary, Queen of Scots, had to get three hacks with her headsman with the headsman's dull old axe before her noggin was liberated from her body. The guillotine was quick and clean, though, and didn't require any particular skill on the part of the executioner, which made it easy to get rid of all of those rich snots during the French Revolution. They just lined them and ran them through the guillotine like an assembly line, or rather, a disassembly line. <laughs> That's such a stupid joke. The voice paused again to, to chuckle. Whatever it was, it seemed to be having a very good time at Millie's expense. Oh, expense, sorry. Saudi Arabia, where your parents are, am I right? Still uses beheading as their preferred form of capital punishment. They use a sword, which I find rather stylish and dramatic. Saudi Arabia, Millie thought. Her parents were so far away, so unable to help her. And now, as she was facing down death, she strangely felt more love for them than she ever had. Sure, they were weird and they made strange decisions and and stupid mistakes, but she knew they loved her. She thought of her dad's awful jokes and of her mum reading her story after story at bedtime when she was little. Maybe her parents were different from other kids' parents, but they had always taken care of her basic needs, and they had always made her feel loved and safe. Millie wanted to be safe. 